Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour and Company. Here's what's coming up. I am pleased to announce that Joseph R. Biden has received 16 votes for President of the United States. In normal times, a little known curiosity. Today, the Electoral College formal declaration on the 2020 election takes on added significance. Presidential historian Michael Beschloss and Republican voters against Trump founder Sarah Longwell join me. And I'm hoping these words don't ring so hollow when you hear me say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Musical shapeshifter Andrew Bird on his first holiday album, Harp, and on mining inspiration from the pandemic. Then, if we care about black and brown lives, we're going to have to make a massive investment in the communities that are being disproportionately hit by COVID. Ahari Srinivasan speaks to Harlem Children's Zone President Jeffrey Canada and CEO Kwame Owuso Kesi about breaking the cycle of poverty. Almond Poor and Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund. Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London. A routine exercise in American democracy took place today in the Electoral College, and yet, from police escorts to undisclosed locations, electors face unprecedented measures to ensure that they can do their job safely, that is, rubber stamping their state's election result. This, as President Trump continues to call it, quote, the most corrupt election in U.S. history, providing no evidence of widespread voter fraud after five weeks of lawsuits and recounts that in fact led nowhere. And he has yet to concede to President-elect Joe Biden. Many hope today's vote will bring an end to that political saga, just as they also hope for an end to the worst symptoms of the pandemic, as the first COVID-19 vaccines are administered in the country. But. As Americans try to build their immunity against the virus, perhaps it is the health of American democracy that is at stake today. And to discuss this, I'm joined by strategist and Republican Voters Against Trump co-founder Sarah Longwell, and also by presidential historian and best-selling author Michael Beschloss. Welcome, both of you, from Washington, D.C. Uh, it's really good to have you. And this, again, has, has captivated uh, the world's attention, uh, as I said, you know, a little noticed event in the past. So, Sarah Longwell, do you think once they, you know, once they establish what the election actually did, will this bring the deniers back into, into line, do you think? Unfortunately, I don't think so. Um, I think the rot runs pretty deep now. You know, when Donald Trump became president, everybody was understandably alarmed. But I always said to them, look, it's going to be okay. Republicans, elected Republicans, they're responsible people. They will be guardrails on this president. But my faith in that has been eroded over the last four years, and it has culminated in this 126 congressmen signing on to this Texas lawsuit, which was just going to throw out millions and millions of people's votes. Um, the Republican Party is entirely captured by Donald Trump. A full 77% of Republican voters don't believe the election results. And so this is the kind of thing that is tragic for democracy. It is really undermining our faith. And the problem is, is that there is buy-in now from our elected officials, from elected Republicans, from the party uh, that I had long belonged to. And so when you have the people who are in power actively undermining uh, the election process, what are, you know, that sends a terrible signal to voters, and it is the reason there's so little confidence uh, in these election results. So, Michael Beschloss, take, take us, sort of sit back a little bit and take the big picture of history. Has there ever been anything like this sort of 
undermining of confidence. Um, we read that back in the, uh, I guess, the 1960 election, there was some, you know, back and forth during the Electoral College process between Kennedy and Nixon. But this buy-in that Sarah talks about by the, you know, the authorities in the Republican Party of Donald Trump's misinformation, disinformation, and lies. Walk us through that. Well, Christian, you know, you, it used to be that conservatives wanted to uh, make sure that, there were, that Americans had a lot of confidence in their institutions rather than lying about them and trying to undermine faith that a free election is actually a free election with real results. And, you know, what Sarah mentioned is totally right, which is that we're now in an, uh, another universe where a majority, according to the polls, of Republicans who voted for Donald Trump now believe that the election has been stolen from him. This is something that has nothing to do with reality. And he has been making a, a big effort to make sure that they believe this and also to try to, in fact, take an election that he did not win. For instance, today, you're quite right, Christian, in saying that these meetings in the 50 states of electoral college presidential electors, it's usually so unexceptional that we're not even aware it's happening. In this case, there are death threats against electors. There are rumors that some are being threatened. There are rumors that some are being bribed. I hope none of that happens. I think it's unlikely that it will, but eternal vigilance is always the price of liberty. Then move up to the first week of January when these votes are counted in Congress. You've got possibly a Republican majority in the Senate, a larger number of Republicans in the House than there were a year ago, who knows what trouble they might make on the day that these votes are supposed to be counted and the vice president of the United States, president of the Senate, Mike Pence, is supposed to declare that Joe Biden has been elected president. And finally, the 20th of January. In almost every other case in American history, the outgoing president, even if he's been defeated by the guy who won, goes up with him in the car up to the Capitol, watches the new guy take the oath, shakes hands and gives Americans the sense that there's been a peaceful transfer of power. What the Trump people are now discussing is a counter inaugural where Trump doesn't show up. Trump says Biden stole the election, doesn't deserve to be sworn in today. Maybe they'll have a ceremony in a tent across the Potomac and maybe they'll do it pay-per-view so that the Trump people can earn some money off of this. I mean, I'm not kidding. Maybe they'll get Rudy Giuliani to swear him in oh as if gosh. he's being sworn in for, for a real second term. I hope none of this happens. Probably it won't. But this is this atmosphere of the surreal that we're now being pushed into. I mean, honestly, when you when you lay it out like that, it really is just it beggars belief. It really does. Um, Sarah, I want to put to you what Karl Rove, who you know is no shy, uh, you know, sort of shy, shrinking violet. He's a very, Certainly very uh, tough supporter of conservatism. Was uh, there for President George W. Bush, but this is what he said about Trump's antics right now. If his goal is to lay the predicate to come back in 2024 and run again. Uh, he's helping himself at least gain the nomination, but I think in the long run, he's not helping himself or the country. Uh, I, America likes comebacks, but they don't like sore losers, and he is on the edge of looking like a sore loser. So, Sarah, you know, you galvanized uh, Republicans against Trump, and you succeeded, you and, and everybody else. So t do you think that, that this will last beyond the last breath, like beyond January 20th? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, I think the reason that Karl Rove is out there kind of trying to nudge uh, Trump off the stage is that there are a lot of establishment Republicans right now who are trying to fight for two Senate seats in Georgia, and they're very concerned about uh, the president and his allies, people like Lynn Wood down in Georgia, you know, who are saying things like burn down the GOP or, you know, don't show up and vote for these establishment Republicans because they're not fighting hard enough uh, to steal the election for Donald Trump. And so I think that there's you know, there's this weird dance going on with Republicans where on one hand, they don't want to buck him. And so they'll do things like sign on to crazy amicus briefs. You know, you've got people like Lindsey Graham and Ted Cruz out there saying, yes, this was fraudulent. But at the same time, they need people to turn out in Georgia. You know, there's a lot of Republicans who want to run for president in 2024 uh, who are not named Donald Trump. And so they, they're trying to figure out, uh, I think so far unsuccessfully, how you kind of nudge this guy off the stage and reset the party 
Um, but unfortunately, you know, because Donald Trump has such a grip and because they're also afraid, I mean, just look at what Donald Trump is doing right now, going after people like Governor Kemp or Governor Ducey, uh, the way he is, he is stirring up uh, sort of uh, people who are, who are acting violent or are, are threatening, you know, the Michigan legislature. Uh, like people, people want and need his support, uh, but at the same time, they also really need him to go. And that is the way that Donald Trump is really boxed in the Republican Party and why they're going to have such a difficult time shaking him loose. And I just will say, you know, this is what they get for their Faustian bargain is now they have to ride this tiger. They helped gin these voters up and say, yeah, there's this fraud. And now they have to deal with voters saying to them, well, why aren't you working hard enough to stop this steal then? Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, and maybe we can't answer this question now, about whether Trump has established a new threshold for any number of, of antics that might take place after future American elections. So I want to ask you, again, from the historical perspective, Michael Beschloss. Um, Tim Wu wrote a column. He's a Columbia, law, uh, Columbia University law professor. You must have seen it. And he talked about what actually saved American democracy, not the checks and balances that Madison hoped that Congress would play the biggest part, but the individuals, and I'm just going to read what he said. He basically says, what really saved the republic from Mr. Trump was a different set of limits on the executive, an informal and unofficial set of institutional norms held up by federal prosecutors, military officers, and state elections officials. You might call these values our unwritten constitution. Whatever you call them, they were the decisive factor. Michael Beschloss, do you buy into that? I, I wish I could. It would make me feel better if I could, but I don't. I wish I could say, Christian, today and tonight that the system has worked and that's why Donald Trump is going out of office. Instead, I think historians may very well say, it's going to take decades to know, they may say that Donald Trump might have easily won a second term with a great economy, but for the tragedy of this pandemic and the economic suffering and the racial justice issues that were brought up last summer. So that's not the system saving the country's democracy from a president with contempt for it and with a lust of, uh, for power. That's basically biblical. I wish I could say it was the system. I think what the last four years have shown, and we're seeing it right now, is that the founders never imagined that someone ever could get to be president of the United States who has this kind of disrespect for democracy and is so eager to grab power when, whenever he can. They assumed that the first president would be George Washington. They assumed that future presidents would be like George Washington in their character. And I think the one thing the last four years have shown us is how, many, how much of our democracy really depends on traditions and not strict law. Donald Trump mm -hmm. has been able to uh, appoint three people to the Supreme Court, at least two of those slots he essentially created. With the Congress, he's been able to defy subpoenas with the State Department, Defense Department, Department of Justice. He's put in political people to do his bidding. Those are all the opposite of what the founders intended, but our laws are not strict enough to prevent that. Mm. Let me put it to you, um, Sarah, in a slightly different way then, or the flip side of that coin, if there is one. Um, you gathered Republicans to vote against Trump. In other words, disaffected Republicans, ordinary people who are Republicans who you wanted them not to vote. To an extent, that succeeded, right? And you, you saw how that potentially worked, given who won the actual presidential election, despite the fact that many Republicans were voted for down ballot. Yes. So uh, I think the reason that our campaign was successful is because we recognize that Donald Trump um, for a segment of the Republican Party that he was just too far. And so uh, there are, when, when you look at the results, especially in a lot of these swing states, you'll see that essentially the margin of victory is uh, people who voted for Joe Biden and then voted for Republicans down ticket, uh, which suggests that there, and, and this is something I've known from a lot of the research I've done from being part of the Republican Party, that there's sort of, there is a, a real danger in how many people have gone all in on Trumpism. But then there's this other section of the Republican Party that are kind of still traditional Republicans. You know, they believe in free markets and limited government, and they don't really like Trump. And I think the question is, is 
whether there is a way that the Republican Party, after you know Joe Biden uh, does become the president, uh, whether there's a way to kind of recalibrate uh, the party around um, you know a vision of itself that is both forward-looking but is not rooted in Trumpism. I wish I had more optimism about that. Uh, or can the Democratic Party, under somebody like Joe Biden, sort of offer a place for some of these disaffected Republicans to go? A lot of these suburban voters who, you know, are center right in their orientation, um, but really don't like the conspiracy mongering and all of the hatred and, and so much that comes along with the MAGA right. And so I think that if the Democrats can offer Republicans uh, a home, that that could be a new realignment that could potentially um, be good for them. And just to go to something Michael was saying, though, one of the other things that I think has to happen immediately where you could get a lot of, or at least some Republicans on board, is doing, you know, after Richard Nixon, um, post Watergate, there was a series of reforms in which they passed laws so that things that had historically been norms were now laws. They should do that again. There should be a package of reforms that say, hey, you know what? You can't put your kids in the White House and let their spouses run the executive branch. You have to release your tax returns. Um, there should be a bunch of these um, reforms that, that Republicans could get behind because it does kind of rein in executive power. And right. some of that would help us to not repeat what happened with Donald Trump. Just quickly before I turn back to Michael, I just want to ask you the same question. Um, it was, though, federal prosecutors, I mean, judges who were Republican appointed, for instance. It was the military who refused to go the extra mile and enforce Trump's, you know, potentially unconstitutional orders. It was the state officials, Republican state officials, who stood up and said, no, you know, there isn't fraud. Do you take hope, Sarah, from the ordinary people uh, who are not at the top rank of, of, of elected office, who actually stood their ground, Republicans, ordinary Republicans? Absolutely. There have been tremendous profiles and courage. I mean, especially in Georgia, people like Brad Raffensperger, um, who have done the right thing, and even people that you'd never heard of, people who were, you know, there to essentially rubber stamp things, you know, there were part of these canvassing committees in Michigan, um, who tremendous pressure was brought to bear on them to do the wrong thing. And they followed the law and they right. did the right thing. And while that is good and it gives us reason to hope that our institutions, you know, have sort of seen this stress test through, it still shouldn't come to this. It shouldn't come mm -hmm. down to canvassers in Michigan. And so I do think that, that we have to start thinking about how we can uh, strengthen some of our institutions right. beyond simply norms, because there are people like Donald Trump who want to test them. And, and now, Michael Beschloss, I, I want to ask you the, the, the question that seems to be rumbling right now. And several modern day presidents have had, to, had to, have had to do this. And that's the idea of special prosecutor and independent counsel. They're saying now that there may have to be, and maybe President Biden might have to appoint a special counsel or whatever the correct name is uh, to look into any investigations of his son, Hunter. Do you think he should? And, you know, you saw what happened to the first years of the Clinton administration. Then, you know, Trump also with the Russia investigation. Are we going to have yet another administration start with, with that kind of issue? I think President Biden should turn it over to an independent Department of Justice with a really tough attorney general who will make his or her own decisions. That's what we've la lacked for four years. It's especially what we've lacked under Attorney General Barr for the last year and a half. But I, I agree with Sarah's point. It would be nice to see Congress pass laws. But 1974 was light years away from 2020. The Democrats won about four dozen seats in the House. Even among Republicans, there was a big mandate to clean up politics and that Nixon had been a bad president. Even if Donald Trump does not get a second term, which I think is unlikely, almost impossible, but not entirely impossible given everything we're seeing right now, maybe a tiny, tiny, tiny chance of everything goes completely off the rails, there isn't that kind of consensus in Congress right now. So I think even if Trump is gone, Trumpism lives. And if Donald Trump had been able to serve a second term, with Republican leaders in Congress who have been intimidated by him. You know, there were 17 or there were 14 or 17, there are at least more than a dozen attorneys general who supported these ridiculous lawsuits alleging voter fraud. Those are attorneys general that were elected in various states, usually people who try to be above politics. 
we are in a different dimension right now. And the most dangerous thing of all to come back full circle is that number of the number of mainly Republicans, but not all right now who tell pollsters that they think that yeah. the election has been stolen from Donald Trump. You know, yeah. Christiane, in 2004, a lot of Americans thought that Saddam Hussein was, was wrongly thought that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11. Uh, in the Obama years, uh, people who supported the questioning of what Barack Obama said about his religi religious affiliations were in a country where facts are melting be before our eyes, and especially when you have an incumbent president at the moment who's committing a frontal attack on, on those facts. It's very worrying, and as you say, we all have to be vi vigilant. Michael Beschler, Sarah Longwell, thank you both very, very much indeed. And of course, it goes without saying that all of this speaks to America's credibility abroad. Now, the day after the U.S. election, the Trump administration, the State Department, was urging Ivory Coast in West Africa to respect their democratic process and rule of law there. The Ivorian president, Alassane Ouattara, won a third term in office despite a two-term limit. And he was sworn in today in a ceremony in the capital, Abidjan. Correspondent Scott McLean has more on this story and an exclusive interview with the president and a warning that this report includes some graphic images. This video shows people in Ivory Coast blocking a major highway last month to protest the re-election of the country's president. Then sometime after the video ends, shots are fired. This was the aftermath of what was supposed to be a peaceful protest. Victims lying motionless on the pavement. Witnesses told Human Rights Watch that there were three people killed after Ivorian security forces opened fire. The government says investigations are underway, but President Alassane Ouattara, who spoke exclusively to CNN, has made up his mind. No, this is a lie. I had given strict instruction to the uh, defense forces not to use fire, guns, and no one shot among the uh, defense forces. It's clearly premature at this point to call that, that research a lie. The shooting capped off a string of pre- and post-election protests and violence. 85 people have been killed on both sides, hundreds more injured, and more than 15,000 fled the country, fearing a return to the civil war violence that brought President Ouattara to power almost a decade ago. Opposition supporters say he should not have been allowed to run for a third term, since the Constitution limits presidents to just two. It's a decision I, I'm glad I took today, because the country would have been in a mess if I had not been a candidate. Do you understand why some of your opponents and a lot of people in your country were upset by your decision? No, I think they just know I could, they could not win. If they want to grab power without election, they're not Democrats. <laughs> While the Ivorian Supreme Court allowed the president to run, the Electoral Commission barred 40 others from challenging him. Does that sound like democracy to you? Let me tell you, uh, democracy does not mean that anyone should come and run. We have very young countries, very fragile countries. Candidates should be able to say what they're going to do for the people and for the country. Those candidates who were allowed to run boycotted the election before the vote and afterwards set up a parallel government to organize a new poll. Suppose that Donald Trump decided to form a government because Biden has won, has won the election. He would be sent to jail right away. And this is what we're doing in Cote d'Ivoire. Election observers from the American Carter Center found serious concerns about restrictions on civil liberties, freedom of expression, and the right to vote and be elected, which threatened to undo democratic progress. But it seems the rest of the world is unwilling to make a fuss, not even France, which has strong ties to its former colony. With a relatively recent instance of civil war in only 2010 and 11 in the country, and before the election there being a real possibility of returning to that. I think it was kind of seen as better to just accept what is and what people know. Democracy has been sacrificed in the name of stability. I think it's fair to say that, yes. 
And Scott McLean also reports that opposition candidates face charges of terrorism and up to life in prison for denouncing the vote and creating that rival government. We will monitor this story in the Ivory Coast very closely. But now we turn to an internationally acclaimed musical innovator. Andrew Bird is a singer, a songwriter, a violinist, also with the ability to whistle any tune. His new festive album, Heart, features a collection of Christmas songs, which he wrote during lockdown. Bird is also branching out from music this year, making his acting debut in the new season of the hit TV show, Fargo. And he's joining us now from Ojai, California. Welcome to the program, Andrew Bird. Thanks for having me. So, okay, talk to me about Hark, but especially, I think you started this in April. I mean, that was last spring, and you're contemplating and, and, and you know, producing a holiday album. What, tell me how, how that works. Well, uh, most holiday albums are made off season um, in order to make it in time for, uh, for the holidays. So uh, it was, you know, this is the beginning of lockdown and uh, I wasn't feeling especially inspired to write, um, you know, the next Andrew Bird record. So I thought I'd uh, um, try to write a comforting uh, holiday album. Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wondered whether when you were writing and, and, and doing the album back in April and those months, did you expect us to be where we are today? Uh, I was just getting uh, uh, the notion that uh, when, we, when the holidays come around, we might still be in a critical situation, not be able to see our loved ones. And... It was just starting to, you know, there were we were all going through stages of acceptance with the, from day to day at that time. But it, it was just starting to occur to me uh, that we might be in that 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 boat. So uh, uh, I started writing about it. Yeah, that feeling. Well, listen, we are very lucky because you've agreed to play a little bit for us from this album. And I just wondered if you wouldn't mind. I see you have your violin there. Play p potentially a minute of of whatever you would like to play. Yeah, this one is uh, as uh, about what we're just talking about, Christmas in April. Um. I'm wanting to hold you, keep you with me this year. You're my darling. To whisper sweet words of comfort in your ear. No more sorrow and no more fear. Oh, my love, we will, you know, if we can be under the moon. Writing a song about Christmas in April this year. And you know, folks, that's that's just kind of messed up. I'm wanting, I'm hoping these words don't ring so hollow when you hear you say Merry Christmas and Happy. Maybe autumn winds blow away all your fear. I said Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. That is lovely. Thank you very, very, very much. Look, I'm, I'm going to ask you, actually, because I, I heard the interview you did with the surgeon and writer Atul Gawande, and, and he was asking you about how you came to music. And you told him um, that, actually, at, at one point, you wanted to be a doctor, a, a psychiatrist, because of, you know, you were fascinated by body language and people's behavior. How has that played into, you know, your particularly unique style of, of music making? Well, um, 
you know, in, it, it mostly is in, in respect to my, my lyrical interests and my curiosity. Um, a lot of my songs deal with, uh, you know, how we behave as individuals and how we behave in a group, like kind of mob rule, um, and then solitude and childhood and um, mental illness, all these things I'm, I'm drawn to as subject matter. Uh, but I'm not, I haven't really thought about how it affects the, uh, the, the musical, the, the playing aspect of things. Um, how did you cope with lockdown? Well, I, uh, you know, I'm a performer, uh, and I really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the road for the last uh, 24 years, so to, to suddenly have a life with no events um, is, uh, I would basically just get up and record a song um, and put it out on Instagram to get some sort of satisfaction of performing. Um, I, I want to play a clip, actually, it's from the music video from uh, one of your new songs, Night is Falling, and then we'll talk about it. Night's falling But you're not alone, no, you're not alone Take courage That you're not alone, no, you're not alone of course, the words are lovely, the music is lovely, the sentiment is lovely, but the images are also lovely. And that's your mother, isn't it? Beth Bird, who's the uh, artist. What was it like collaborating with her on this? Well, I've collaborated, collaborated with her once before on um, a project, uh, The Red Shoes. Um, and she's, uh, you know, she, she's very key to my whole development as an artist. and growing up and she started me on violin when I was four and we just always had really interesting conversations about art and music and psychology. She has a psychology degree as well. And um, to collaborate with her was just kind of a nice consolation for not being able to see her, which I haven't seen my folks for a year and a half now, the pandemic. So um, it was, a, it was uh, a nice nice thing for both of us. It really must have been. And I wonder whether, you know, you do you consider your songs, and particularly these ones, comforting? Are they are you are you trying to reach out to people, you know, such as yourself who hasn't seen your parents for so long and so many others are in the same and, and even worse circumstances? Are you trying to, to give something as well, some comfort? Uh, absolutely. I mean, not just in the uh in the ambiance of the record and, and the melodies, um, which I'm drawn towards more kind of the darker, uh, more minor key. Uh, I find the darkness to be comforting as well as the light. But um, a lot of the original songs like Night's Falling and Alabaster are dealing with people on the outside, maybe with, um, without this family support or, or living on the edge that have been sort of pushed over the edge by, by the pandemic. Um, and thinking about people that are living alone and and uh, on lockdown and, um, and needing uh, you know familiar comforts and uh, and and last night at a performance you you played a song um, from from I, I think it's souvenirs by John Prine who he himself the songwriter died of complications from coronavirus in April I want to just play a little snippet of that song. All the snow is turned to water Christmas days had come and gone Broken toys and faded colors All that's left to linger on I hear graveyards and old pawn shops For they always bring me tears Childhood souvenirs. 
So, of course, that was from a performance before, you know, that you'd recorded earlier, before last night's performance. But did his, you know, passing, I mean, that was the specific reason you included it on your album, or would you have done anyway? Uh, I've been covering that song for years, but uh, I think that must have uh, encouraged me to, to try to honor him with that, with that cover on this album. And uh, it is a Christmas song. It's sort of a post-Christmas uh, uh, crash. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it, it still addresses, yeah, it captures beautifully the, uh, the nostalgia and the, the memory and uh, how that can be a tricky, tricky thing. Where did the whistling come from? I'm, I, you did a tiny weeny bit when, when, when you began, um, you know, when you played uh, the, the, the first song for us. But I mean, you're a virtuoso whistler. How did you even discover that? How do, how do, you, how do you do that? Do, can you do a little for us or not? Yeah. Um, oh, go on, so I, people have, there's all sorts of techniques of whistling. Mine is more of a full uh, operatic style where it's Um, and it's really, uh, I didn't realize what a powerful instrument it was because I've spent my whole life playing this incredibly difficult one to think yeah. that, uh, th that something so casual is whistling, which I do, you know, when I'm doing the dishes, could be <laughs> worthy of your, your attention. Um, so it took me a while to, to realize that it could, it, it was actually a, a very powerful way to get people to um, listen. Honestly, when I was playing solo uh, in earlier in my solo career, like trying to uh, hold an audience attention or get them to stop talking, like the whistling would get people to, you know, what's that? Is that a <laughs> smoke alarm or what is it? <laughs> They're like confused. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, it really, I mean, I'm, I'm a lot of times I'm looping the violin and it's a lot of these um, certain tam timbres that are kind of warm and, and mid rangey and the whistle just is like glass. It cuts right through it. Um, yeah, I, I could listen to that for a long time. I love the whistle. Thank you so much. Andrew Bird with Hark for the holidays. Thank you for joining us. Now, of course, music is also considered a crucial educational tool from the very youngest of ages, and especially as a barrier breaker for less advantaged children. The Harlem Children's Zone is a renowned nonprofit that deploys all tools necessary to help kids in poverty. Jeffrey Canada, who's known for his pioneering work with children, is president, and Kwame Owusu Kese is CEO. Together, they're providing low-income families with critical social and academic services so that kids can keep learning during this pandemic. And now their community-based model is being scaled up nationwide. And here they are explaining this work to our Hari Srinivasan. Christian, thanks. Uh, Kwame Owusu Kese and Jeffrey Canada, thanks so much for joining us. Kwame, I want to start with you. Uh, this is a time where the community around the Harlem Children's Zone, around the rest of the country really, has been dealing with these dual pandemics or these dual crises, both about the virus, but also about racial justice and racial injustice that's been happening on the streets. Um, first, just give us a snapshot of the kids you serve. Who, who is the average child that's coming through these schools? Who's the average person that's availing themselves of the services that the zone has created? Right, well, the, the Harlem Children's Zone is situated in, in central Harlem. And we are, we're targeting what we call the deep end of the pool, the, the students that are most in need of our services. Uh, for example, we, we work very closely in our St. Nicholas housing development. Uh, average family of four uh, makes $18,100 a year. Um, there's 4,000 residents in St. Nicholas housing development. Over half uh, do not have adults who are working. Um, so we're working with a community where there are quite dire circumstances, uh, but a community that we believe in and we know that our young people are full uh, of promise and potential. Uh, so we're, we're really excited to be able to offer comprehensive services uh, to the individuals we serve in Central Harlem. I think too often a common misperception of the work of the Harlem Children's Zone is that we're just a, a charter school. Uh, but we, we offer a whole host uh, of programs from birth through college that focus on education, youth development, health and wellness, and community building. Kwame, give me an idea of what you've been able to do that is outside what we would traditionally consider a school's responsibility, especially in the context of a pandemic. What kinds of services, what kinds of needs were you starting to fill? 
in many ways, the Harlem Children's Zone views ourselves as first responders. And as Jeff and I continue to talk about what the devastating impacts of the pandemic would have in, in Harlem, we had to spring into action. Uh, so immediately in March, we surveyed our families. And I think one of the benefits of having proximity to our community is we can have real-time data to inform the decisions that, we, that we've been able to make. Um, so we sent out a survey where we had over 3,300 families respond. We also were tracking the clicks on our website for resource page, uh, on our resource page, and we were able to triangulate and develop a five-pronged approach to our COVID response. Uh, there were multi-elements to that. So one, the need for emergency relief funds. Uh, two, the idea of protecting our most vulnerable, so providing masks. Um, and launching a public health campaign. The third was bridging the digital divide and providing laptops uh, to our community. The fourth was preventing learning loss. Um, so not only being able to have high quality virtual engagements, but also preparing for safe re-entry. And we have converted some of our facilities to a rapid testing facility. And the fifth and final component was mitigating the mental health crisis, understanding that there's massive amounts of toxic stress. So making sure that our families had access to proper virtual interventions. To date, we've been able to provide and distribute over 35,000 masks, about 1,400 laptops, 2,200 thermometers. We've conducted probably 2,500 PCR and antigen tests, uh, not to mention uh, being able to provide high quality live instruction uh, for our students in our schools from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day. Uh, so there's no replacement for in-school learning. Uh, but being able to have teachers on live and be able to work uh, directly with our students, I think has been a very unique aspect of our offerings at the organization, particularly as I'm in conversation with um, high, pro high performing practitioners across the country. Uh, Jeffrey Canada, you ran this school for years. You're acutely aware of the existing struggles that are there, the disparate health impacts, the structural effects of poverty. And in many ways, these are even though they might be incredibly low paying jobs, these are some of the most essential of essential workers. So I, I think we have totally underestimated the importance of people who educate our children, teach them every day, support them after school. Uh, I think that uh, we're facing a crisis now uh, in education uh, that's on top of another crisis. We already had a crisis of underpaying teachers, of teachers not staying in the field because they didn't have enough money to support themselves and their families. Uh, now, on top of that, uh, we have a crisis with children. Our kids have been out of school now for close to six, seven months. And for poor children, this is devastating. Uh, this is a time where Kwame and I are saying to our country, if we value equity, if we care about black and brown lives, we're gonna to have to make a massive investment in the communities that are being disproportionately hit by COVID because these are the same communities that we're learning have suffered for the last 50 years by structural racism, by a disinvestment in those communities. You layer on top of that what's happening around health and jobs uh, and food and housing, and we see a crisis that we feel like the country has not responded to. What have you learned during this period about what is required, especially to reach the kids that are hardest to reach, that might be in the most difficult situations at home, whether they have the bandwidth that is in broadband or is in time, as in space, as in a support network in their parents? Um, what have you learned during this pandemic that can help other schools learn on how to reach these kids? What we were transparent with our community about is that we're not going to be able to prevent COVID from showing up on our doorstep. But what is within our responsibility is making sure that we're mitigating against any potential for massive spread. So having uh, well-tailored systems and processes in place in terms of uh, if someone is symptomatic, do you have an isolation room? The, we had the ability of having on-site testing, which is really helpful to be able to make timely decisions. School design and scheduling and while, how you're able to schedule to allow folks to be in pods. So in the event that if there was an instance of, of COVID that showed up, it only impacts a small number of folks. So having the systems and processes in place is really important and just understanding um, programming. Like who is your target audience and how can you reimagine programs to be able to offer both having a virtual option in the event 
to mitigate against disruptions, right? Because inevitably there's a scare that will happen, someone may be COVID impact, but how do you make sure that you have a programmatic design that can um, least impact a student due to disruptions? And I think that's been informing our approach uh, during this time and have been some of the major lessons that we've learned in this time period. Jeffrey, you came out of retirement to help scale some of the ideas that you're talking about, to think about education holistically beyond just the walls of the physical classroom. And you're now working with organizations in six different cities. Um, why was this important? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I, I smiled because I was happy in retirement. Uh, and folks told me I would hate it, but I didn't hate it at all. Uh, and when Kwame came to me uh, and said that his vision as the new CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone uh, was to actually figure out a way we could help uh, save another million children by getting them on the road to uh, social and economic uh, mobility in this country. I just found that too tantalizing uh, to resist. Uh, and you know, uh, what we've discovered, there are community groups around this country that are already doing high quality work. And this is what I don't think people understand. People think we're out trying to uh, simply recreate the Harlem Children's Zone. No, they're a set of principles about working comprehensively with children, about providing support for their health, their mental health, their physical health, their spiritual health, and high quality education that we think works for children no matter where they are. They work for middle class children, uh, but poor children in particular need these supports. And so we said, let's figure out how we can help, help turbocharge these efforts around the country. Let's find the best places that are doing high quality work and let's try and bring the resources and supports to help them scale their efforts so that we can impact as many children as humanly possible over the course of the next 10 years. Kwame, you grew up in challenging circumstances. Um, what was the key to try and getting you from where you started to getting through Harvard and running this institution now? Well, I would say despite the challenges that I, I, I grew up in, I think those challenges are what define me. And I think some of the key aspects of what led to the, the, the success that I've been able to achieve um, exist in our model here in Harlem. So that is the idea of at, at the core, I was given a fantastic opportunity uh, to, to have a fantastic education at a local elementary school called Venerini Academy. Uh, because the nuns fell in love with my mom who played bingo at that school. Uh, they gave me a scholarship that absolutely changed my life trajectory. So in addition to having a high quality education, there were quality wraparound services in terms of um, athletics and the arts and enrichment programs and exposures that I had. Uh, but I would say the one of the most impactful things that I think turbocharged my trajectory was having adults that believed in my potential. At the time in, in the 90s, uh, there was no thought of having a black president. And they would always say to me, you, you're going to be the first black president of the United States. I had no political aspirations. But the fact that they, they believed that put a battery in my back that said, hey, if I can focus on something and set my mind to, to achieving a goal, anything is possible. And I have a community of support. I have social capital to be able to provide me the resources, the expertise, the know-how, the support, the love, the guidance, the knowledge uh, to be able to achieve success and better my family situation. So I think th those were some of the critical elements uh, in my personal story that uh, led to uh, a pathway ultimately to graduate from Harvard College, begin a career on, on Wall Street at Morgan Stanley, and ultimately end up in, in my dream job, dream job at the Harlem Children's Zone. So Jeffrey, you've watched kids like Kwame go through the Harlem Children's Zone schools, whether they started as kindergartners, and now some of them are in college. The idea of college was probably drilled into these kids, the importance of it, the grandeur of it, and here they are, comes fall, and they're doing it over Zoom. This, this is, you know, to me, one of the continuing tragedies of uh, what's been happening in our country. Um, what we found is that uh, there are a group of kids who actually need to get away to college to be successful. Uh, and I was one of those kids. There would have been no way that I could have stayed in the South Bronx and did college work by Zoom. My life was 
uh, too chaotic. There were too many pressures on me. I needed to be able to get away and focus and go to a library and, and have that whole environment change. Uh, so I am worried about even our kids who are successful, even the ones who are in college right now. I worry that they struggle because they're home. They're often the strongest members of their family. Everybody is pulling on them to, to try and help to get a job, to try and help pay some bills. And you know we've been preparing these young people to go to college. So we're gonna do everything humanly possible to help them. But I am telling you, uh, up and down the whole cradle to career pipeline, we have a generation of young people who have been traumatized by this experience. Uh, and it's not going to take six months or seven months to uh, make up for this. Uh, we're going to be working on this problem for the next decade, trying to make up for what has happened uh, in 2020 and 2021 to poor children in this country. Kwame, one of the more acute needs that your school fills is school lunches or breakfasts, just plain old food. Well, how have you gotten around that, uh, considering how important that nutrition is for everything else, and some of these families might be really reliant on that school lunch? It's a great question. I think uh, typically in a year, uh, we have a chef that produces over a million meals uh, a year for, for our community, and the, the role that the school plays um, for feeding our young people and making sure that they have a healthy and warm meal is, is so critical. And one of the things that we've been able to do um, for one is just being able to provide uh, a number of support for our community given the food insecurity. So to date, we've handed out 4,000 packages of two week supplies of uh, non perishable items. Um, and monthly, we have harvests uh, where to date we've distributed over 30,000 pounds of fresh produce. Most specifically to our students in our schools, we continue to be able to provide a delivery service that is able to provide meals every single day to our young people to ensure that food insecurity is not one of the things that's going to impede their ability to learn. What is the role of government here and where has it done well and where has it fallen short? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so here's where government really did well. Uh, the first CARES Act, uh, the ability to increase the unemployment payments to folks, uh, knowing that huge numbers of Americans were uh, out of work for no reason of their own. Uh, I cannot tell you how many people who I know that lifeline literally saved them during this period of time uh, that we've had to shut down the country to try and deal with uh, this pandemic. Um, but that also is where we're failing uh, our citizens right now. Uh, the fact that our Congress could not get together with the president uh, and pass a new uh, series of supports for uh, families and the unemployed in this country is an absolute disaster. Uh, and I think it's criminal. And I I'm not uh, sort of exaggerating. People are going to die because they don't have the basic necessities. They cannot buy medicine. They cannot buy food. There is no way for them to pay their rent. And they feel like they've been abandoned by the government, which has essentially said, we're going on vacation. Uh, we're not going to deal with this problem in America right now. Uh, this is in the midst of a health pandemic. Uh, I think uh, this is a shame. And I'm, in, I'm ashamed of our country for failing to aid its citizens in their time of need. Uh, this is a, when you begin to look at all of the people dying in this country and they co uh, compare it to we're losing more people in a day than we lost in Pearl Harbor. And then the government says we're not going to help. Uh, I think that's an uh, absolute disgrace. Uh, and we need to hold our government officials accountable uh, for their failure to act. Kwame? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think we're at a unique moment in our country right now where the collective consciousness, consciousness is primed for action. And if we're talking about having a meaningful impact at scale, there must be a response from the government to be able to bring and marshal the resources that are necessary in order to fight on the front lines of this war. So whether it is PPE support, other financial support, particularly in the most devastated communities, uh, so that there can be a multifaceted uh, response to a multidimensional threat in COVID in the social, social justice environment. And it's imperative 
uh, for the government to be able to step up to the leadership mantle because this can't just be done on the backs of nonprofits or just on the backs of philanthropic dollars or even just corporate dollars. There needs to be a comprehensive response um, in order to be able to achieve true scale and that leadership has to uh, come from the government. Kwame Uwosu Kesi and Jeff Canada, thanks so much for joining us. Thank, thank, you. thank you for having us on. Such an important program there. And finally, speaking of schools, we remember a man who actually educated generations of readers on the gritty world of Cold War spy games. Best-selling novelist John le Carre, whose real name was David Cornwell, has died at the age of 89. His family says the cause was pneumonia. Le Carre's career spanned more than 50 years, relying in part on his own work in espionage, Many of his gripping books were turned into hit films, including The Spy Who Came In From The Cold in 1965. The character, George Smiley, was so well known as to be almost real. And Le Carre himself even had a small cameo role in the 2016 BBC adaptation of his Night Manager. On Twitter, the head of MI6 called Le Carre a giant of literature who left his mark on MI6 through his evocative, brilliant novels. That is some endorsement. And that's it for our program tonight. Remember, you can follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour and Company on PBS. And join us again tomorrow night.